Hi, I'm a cop, and when I'm not going into anaphylactic shock over grazing fentanyl or accidentally killing dogs, I'm doing the most important job a police officer can do, enforcing rigid copyright laws. I'm here today to talk to you about piracy, or the unlawful downloading and distribution of digital goods such as software or video games. Software piracy is a crime. If little Timmy wants to download PowerPoint 2006 and doesn't pay for it, he will need to be gunned down in the street like the dog that he is. Despite the title, this video will not be a guide on how or where to pirate video games. Treat this video as a hypothetical. If you were to pirate video games, which we do not do, right? Don't pirate. What theoretically would that be like? What are two arguments you could make tied together with a conclusion in the form of a video essay on youtube.com in defense of video game piracy? The footage in the video you're about to see are all of games I legally own because piracy is illegal and I'm a cop. I can't do crimes, that would be like double illegal. Now that we know that piracy is evil and if you do it, God will not forgive you, I can finally turn around and say, piracy is really cool and you should do it. That's, that's the title of the video. <laughs> Video games have a preservation problem. Old games just aren't maintained or preserved in the way they should be, getting left by the wayside with no way for new players to play them. Take Demon Souls, for example. It's culturally important because from its loins the entire Souls series was birthed, but it's getting increasingly difficult if you actually want to play the fucking thing. The easiest option is the PS5 version, a ground-up remake of the game developed by Bluepoint. The remake painstakingly recreates everything about the original game, such as animations, enemy placements, cutscenes, item descriptions, on top of general quality of life changes like being able to roll in any direction. This remake of a PS3 game costs £70, but the remake of the game completely changes the art style. The Boletarian Palace used to be this decrepit, dark fantasy castle. Now it looks like Duloc from the Shrek direct-to-DVD Halloween special. But this is the only official way of playing the game in 4K at 60fps. Every other option is based on the original PS3 version with 30fps as a target. The first option is the physical release, which Sounds simple enough, if you buy something physically, that's yours forever. Big gaming can come rip your copy of Too Human for the Xbox 360 out of your cold, dead hands. The thing about physical media though is... Well... It's fragile. Over time, physical media will be lost without a proper digital backup. Cartridge games can erode, disk drives can break, disks can get scratched, and in the age of updates and patches, a physical game sometimes won't even have the game on it. You also run into the issue of distribution. Not even getting into what happens to indie games that can't have a physical release, physical games are finite by nature. There will always be a limited number of copies, as opposed to digital files where the only thing you really need to do to make a copy is... well physical games. Not the best option for preservation then. What if you want to buy a copy of Demon's Souls digitally? You can buy it on the PS3 store. Luckily it was saved from being shot down last year by the Gamer Cabal and now it's easy to buy a PS3 game digitally. Here's everything you need to do to buy a game digitally on the PS3. Sign in on your PS3. You will then find you cannot do that because you have to generate a new unique password via a web browser which will be your new password but only for signing in on the PS3. 
Now that you're signed in, you're still not ready to buy the video game because you have to go back to your web browser and add funds in increments of five. Go back to your PS3 and attempt to navigate the store with this antiquated search function where you have to input letters from a rolling list. Only now can you legally buy the video game. The last option is streaming, which comes with the highest tier of PS Plus. It has no benefits over the original version, except now you have to wrestle with input delay. Tiny issue with that though? Hey, Sony, where, where is the game? It's advertised on your website as being part of the service, but I fucking checked and it's not there. This service costs £100 a year. To recap, if you want a digital version of Demon's Souls, you would have to play the video game equivalent to Gus Van Sant's Psycho, hope they don't forget to add it to their shitty streaming service, or roll the dice and attempt to solve the lament configuration from fucking Hellraiser. Or you could just pirate it, mod your PS3 to run it, or use the open source emulator or PCS3 to run it on your computer. Emulation is not technically illegal, but it goes hand in hand with piracy when companies do not let you create digital backups. They're also really fucking cool because they let you run games from years ago at higher resolutions or even frame rates in some instances. Want to play Demon's Souls as originally intended? Go ahead, bump up to 1080p. Go up to 4K, the PS5 can, why can't you? You don't need to stop there. Technology hasn't caught up yet, but you can run the game at 120 frames per second with a resolution of 10K, which is about 64 times the original resolution of 720p. With RPCS3, you can do all this and more, making it the definitive way to play. And with Sony's lack of good preservation, Eventually, piracy will become the only way to play Demon's Souls for the PS3. Remakes suck. So then, remasters should be fine, right? For a time, Sega were really good at making old titles available. It's easiest to see this with Sonic. Love him or be wrong, Sonic is an incredibly important series of games. It also gave a hedgehog a gun. Which is badass! The old Sonic games are on everything. As they should be. Every generation, we got a new Mega Drive collection that included most, if not all of them. The PC versions even let you take the ROMs straight out of the files so you could use them on emulators or actual hardware if you wanted. The best versions? were the mobile ports though. They added widescreen support, new content, and the ability to save. Sonic 1, 2, and CD got ports, but sadly Sonic 3 never got the same treatment, and aside from CD, they were locked to Android and iOS. Sega's answer to this was Sonic Origins, a collection of the original four Sonic games finally getting them on consoles in widescreen, handled by the team at Headcanon. It sounded too good to be true. And that's because it was. Sonic Origins fucking sucks. That's not the developer's fault. It's been made clear since the game's release that headcanon were crunched to hell and back just to release ports of 30 year old games on time. And that should tell you everything you need to know about how much Sega really cared about this. On top of its ludicrous price tag of 33 quid, issues include poor physics, menu typos, new glitches, and its inclusion of the Nuvo DRM, because Sega were absolutely terrified you'd steal this and not just download a 32 megabit ROM. It does have some cool 3D islands on the menu though. They you can only zoom into if you buy separate DLC, which also includes character animations in the main menu and letterbox backgrounds. To help us brainless peons understand what the multiple editions even include, Sega released this helpful chart in the form of the Sephiroth from Hebrew and Evangelion fame. It'd be one thing if this version released alongside all the other versions, but Sega removed nearly every single version of these games except the Switch and mobile ports. This includes the PS3 version where Sonic Origins isn't even available. 
because we can't have people buying that instead of the game that isn't even on PS3. You can't even get the ROMs on the PC version officially anymore because they are nowhere to be found within the files, funneling you into a port of these games that cost £4 each individually without one of those versions most useful features. Without proper access to the games you legally bought, you'd be better off skipping Origins entirely and pirating the ROMs so you can access fan-made ports like Sonic 3 Air, which does every everything Origins can and even more. It has everything you can imagine. An accurate recreation of the original game's physics, the ability to unlock new moves that weren't in the original like the drop dash, 50 billion audio and visual options, and full mod support on top of being open source. Air is a borderline perfect recreation of both Sonic 3 and Knuckles, and I don't think Sega could even hope to compare to the work done to make this port work. While I don't agree with it, Air even makes it mandatory to have an official ROM from the Steam release, but thanks to Sega's botched launch of Origins, you can't even access Air without piracy now. Piracy opens the door to not only let old games exist well beyond their years, but come back better than ever. Though, at the very least, Demon Souls and Sonic are still available. What happens when games aren't? When discussing any issue, it's quite easy to get tunnel vision. Despite what our entire histories would like you to think, the US and the UK are not the only places in the world. There's a whole world of piracy out there we just leave these silly borders. But to do that, I'd have to catch a flight. Okay, so it turns out, planes, very expensive, and I blew my entire budget on this outfit. So instead, I just talked to some friends around the world and asked them how piracy was where they were. First off, Russia. They've been in the news a lot recently because Putin's been a bit of a shit, and as a result, a ton of companies have pulled out of commerce there. This means the sale of video games has kind of stagnated, pushing more people towards piracy and bootlegging. This is nothing new for Russia. You might remember the Soviet Union, a fascist regime that still tricks conservatives and tankies into thinking it was communist to this day. While the Union was dissolved in 1981, its shadow still lingered. Game companies just weren't shipping games to Russia. This opened the door for Dendi. Dendi was a branded clone of Nintendo's Famicom, first released in 1992. Thanks to Russia's relationship with copyright law at the time, as in there wasn't one, Dendi was a widely available product, with Dendi adverts, Dendi magazines, and even a Dendi TV show which just reviewed games. For the Dendi, Dendi's a really fun name to say. Dendi sold gangbusters. Doing so well, eventually Nintendo came knocking to make a deal with the creators, leading to the humble bootleg system becoming an official Nintendo product. Nintendo, the company who will burn down entire archives of NES ROMs, even if they don't legally own them, were perfectly okay shaking hands with a bootleg company selling their stuff without permission because... That was the state of gaming in Russia. It was simply easier to do that. And that mindset has carried forward, with Russia having the fifth highest rate of software piracy according to a study carried out in 2002. That was a long time ago, but it's hard to think it'd be much different now, especially with so many companies pulling out there. The lack of regulations around bootlegging in Russia has created a culture where piracy is a normal thing everyone does. In South America, games are fucking expensive. In Brazil, games can go beyond 300 real thanks to a lack of good regional pricing that takes into account the average cost of living. God of War Ragnarok costs 350 real, which is about 28% of the monthly minimum wage. This would be like if games in the UK cost £425 each. In Argentina, there is a 75% markup on games, and a PS5 on Sony's official website costs the equivalent of £1,800. 
based on their minimum wage, you would need to save for seven months without spending a single penny to even afford one. You know those articles that are like, I bought a house at 20 and all I did was stop buying soy lattes. And then you read it and it's because they had rich parents and had no living costs whatsoever. Buying a PS5 in Argentina is a little like that. Oh, you want a PS5? Just work for nothing for seven whole months and refuse to eat, pay your bills, or live, you fucking moron. All that in mind, alongside digital piracy, there is a huge market for bootlegs of any kind, with retail shops that sell unlicensed games being a common thing. Consoles that are easily modifiable to get around copy protections are popular for this reason. You might eagerly await the release of the new FIFA, but in Brazil, you can get a modded edition of PES for the PS2 called Bomba Patch, with new versions coming out weekly at some points, with updated player rosters, new pitches, and up to date music, including an original theme song which currently sits at about 1.5 million views. Since its start in 2007, many more platforms have gotten support for the mod, and Bumble Patch currently has potentially hundreds of versions. In Argentina, you can get shit like this. This is Half-Life Dopefler Effect, a modded copy of the original Half-Life that one of my sources graciously sent my way. It's pretty much just the original Half-Life unchanged, except headcrabs are now Pepe the Frog. The main menu music is an awful mashup of Kendrick Lamar's swimming pools, parenthesis drank, and some other song, and helicopter noises are dubbed over by an actual guy. This level of class carries over to the box art, as it is just covered in decade-old memes, and includes a quote from Kotakuk. So, clearly, we're dealing with the most advanced comedic minds here. Despite these varied cultures, they all have one thing in common. Playing video games is nigh impossible if you aren't rich, and that leaves piracy and bootlegging as the only option to experience the art form. And that's fine by me. Everyone should be able to experience art, regardless of class or location. And if you think someone should have to choose between playing Mario Odyssey and putting food on the table, you can fuck right off. This use of piracy to open up games to wider audiences isn't exclusive to other countries either. This is where fan translations come in. Fan translations are exactly that. Fan created ROM hacks to make games available in other languages. A famous example is Mother 3, a game which Nintendo still refuses to translate officially. Despite its influence on popular works such as Undertale and Homestuck, or Lucas' prominent appearances in every Smash game since Brawl, it's never released outside of Japan. Yet, it's been able to stay relevant thanks to the talented work of Tomato and a group of Earthbound fans who fully translated the game from Japanese to English and implemented the translation as a mod. This translation is not technically, technically illegal, illegal, as they require you to provide your own ROM to access it, as stated on their website, but with the game's already limited release, piracy is once again going to become the only valid option eventually. To find out more about what goes into producing a translation, and how piracy affects their work, I talked to my friend Curtain Fire, who worked in the translation for Rockman Battle and Friends, and the Ninja Gaiden Restoration Patch. They'll look at the script. They'll try to get it into an English counterpart, see how feasible it is to insert the English text. Oftentimes, relative search is used to find character tables. You know, a tile editing program might be used so that an English font is inserted to a game if it's not already there. But oftentimes, not every time, you'll need somebody with good assembly knowledge to get a translation finished. So if you go to romhacking.net, there is no piracy allowed on the site. You're supposed to use your legally dumped ROMs, but, you know, let's just say companies are not very good at selling their old ROMs anywhere. The vast majority of companies will just hoard 30, 20 year old ROMs, and the only way to reliably get them is piracy or paying just a huge amount of money through secondhand markets. Make of that what you will. This is the problem we keep coming back to. 
With a lack of support from the companies who own the games to keep the games available, piracy becomes a necessary tool to access games that would be otherwise inaccessible. Why is piracy wrong then? How is video game piracy this boogeyman that is so morally reprehensible? What is the bulletproof counter-argument that proves, without a doubt, that piracy is evil? People making Nintendo emulators and Nintendo ROMs are helping publishers by making old games available that are no longer being sold by the copyright owner. This does not hurt anyone, and allows gamers to play old favourites. What's the problem? The problem is that it's illegal. That's it. There's no other reason. The reason companies are allowed to take the moral high ground on piracy is copyright law. It's the antiquated protections that allow companies to hoard art under the guise of protecting creatives. Now, I'm not here to argue about copyright. I do believe that copyright law and its draconian grip over art should be abolished for too many reasons to count, nor am I here to tell you that piracy is correct in every single instance, obviously. I think you should support artists who make good art because that's badass. What I'm trying to say is, unless there is a sudden and substantial change to the way companies handle copyright and the accessibility of art, piracy isn't just an option. Piracy is the only option. That quote, by the way, that's directly from Nintendo, and I want to focus on Nintendo for a bit, because if you're watching this video when it comes out, they're actually in the process of shutting down the entire 3DS and Wii U's digital storefronts, closing for good in March of 2023. So you might want to hurry up and buy as many games as you can before it shuts down? Well, you should've. As of the 29th of August, you cannot add any money to your account. There are a lot of games on those shops, so what is Nintendo's solution for all those games going missing? Well, you can buy half-decade-old Wii U games for £50 on the Switch, and in place of the Virtual Console, a service that you buy old games individually, you can pay a monthly fee to be drip-fed NES games you literally cannot own. It's designed that way, it always has been. The promise of an all-digital future is one where there is no limit to how many things we can create or who can access it. A future where everyone can enjoy art. A lot of people have this idea of a future where emulation is fully supported by every company, where you can buy any ROM of any game on one unified storefront to use how you want. But that's fundamentally impossible because they don't want that. Why do you think, in that quote, Nintendo groups emulation with piracy? Why would Nintendo have such a big issue with something that is technically legal? You might have already noticed it because I've mentioned it a few times already. Technically legal. Which actually means, fuck all. It's true that there is legal precedent that proves emulation is legal with the case of Sony vs. Bleem, but not many people talk about what happened after that. Bleem were a company producing emulators for the PlayStation sold on store shelves. Sony sued them three times and every time Bleem won. But Bleem do not exist anymore. They were ran out of business because of the legal fees from their court battles with Sony costing too much. Despite being in the legal right, Sony were still able to run Bleem out of business. The exact same thing happened to another publicly available emulator, the Virtual Game Station for the Macintosh. Sony sued them, Sony lost, and in response they bought their parent company and shut down production themselves. Legality does not matter. 
even if something is legal and you can prove it, do you feel confident in fighting for that when your opposition can literally run your business into the ground? It was never about legality, it was always about control. Console manufacturers like Nintendo hate emulation because it takes control away from them of the things you own. Nintendo's digital shop shutting down is not an unfortunate casualty of the all digital future. It happens literally by design because you do not own anything. Games are finite because it means that later down the line, they can sell you remakes and remasters so you have to buy the shit you already own all over again. They don't want to give you control to do what you want with games because then they cannot make money off of you. This is built into console infrastructure. You can only buy off of their storefronts, you can only play on their hardware, and then you buy the next one, they take away the old one, and this happens every generation. So in that case, where you literally do not have ownership over anything, your only option to play games will always eventually lead to piracy. Piracy is illegal, but is also the only way forward in an industry that does not treat art as anything other than temporary. Take it from me, take it from every video game company. You should pirate video games. And to the authorities watching this video, I've been lying to you. I'm not actually a cop, I'm Duncan Buckin. And one of the games I've shown in this video was pirated. And it's up to you to figure out which one it is so you can stop me. Because I'm a criminal. I'm a danger to society. And the only way you can catch me is if you figure out which one it is, so good luck, pigs. The clock is ticking.